This is the third in a series of cases out of Manatee County, Florida, all of which I looked into after my season 16 coverage of the Kingfish Boat Ramp murders on Holmes Beach. Because I'm not concerned with cliffhangers or spoilers, I will say right off the bat that the case of 65-year-old Harry Wolf, which I will begin telling you about in this episode, is the case out of all of them that I consider the best possibility as far as being the same perpetrator as the Kingfish case. I am presenting these cases in chronological order, so the previous two cases, the Michelsons and Diane Love, occurred in 1974, ten months apart, no relation to each other and, in my opinion, likely not related to the Kingfish cases, which occurred six years later. Mr. Wolf's murder occurred in 1977, three years after those, and three years before the Kingfish cases. The similarities with his case include caliber of projectile, proximity to one another, and Mr. Wolf was killed in a grocery store parking lot similar to that of one of the Kingfish victims. So let's go ahead and jump right into his story. According to his wife, Harry Wolf had gone to Bradenton on Monday, April 18th, 1977, to golf with a friend or family member, although the details of that trip seem to have faded with the passage of time. The police report contains no interview with said friend or family member, so I'm not even able to confirm that he did in fact meet someone for a game of golf. All of the news reports say that he did. To that point, though, in a set of handwritten notes made by an investigator in 2002 while taking another look at the case, he wrote, Who is Harry's cousin in Northwest Bradenton? Wolf supposedly left for Bradenton at 9 p.m., why so late? Neither of these questions were answered in the police report that I received, so it seems possible that some documents from the initial investigation no longer exist. What I can say is that the Skaggs Albertsons parking lot in Bradenton, Florida, across from the DeSoto Mall, where his truck was found, with him dead inside, was apparently not on his route home. And that's the very first indication that we get that all was not as it seemed. When Mr. Wolf didn't return home as scheduled, his wife reported him missing after 9 p.m. on Wednesday evening. According to her, he'd called earlier that evening, telling her he was on the way home, but then he never showed up. And I want to also note that this is 1977 and remind you that cell phones were not a thing, so this would have been an intentional call for Mr. Wolf from a landline or telephone booth somewhere. On Thursday morning around 9.30 a.m., April 21, 1977, a gentleman by the name of Donald Whalen, an Albertson's employee, approached first responding deputies, who had been summoned by him to the store after he had spotted blood on the ground by the passenger door of a gold Chevrolet pickup that was parked in the far corner of the parking lot. The truck had a camper top over the bed. This camper truck which bore an Ohio license plate, was noticed to be parked there for several days. When responding deputies looked inside the truck, they observed a white male lying on the floorboard of the truck with his feet at the driver's door and his head and shoulders on the passenger side laying against the passenger's door. There was a large amount of blood on the victim's face, his head, and the passenger door itself. His right arm was laying up on the seat with his fingers near the CB radio, which had been pulled from its dash mount bracket, and the CB was facing toward the driver's side, but on the passenger side of the seat, with the mic cord laying over his body, and the mic itself having been dropped approximately at the victim's buttocks area. He was lying on his left side, facing the seat. They noticed the dome light cover had been removed from the interior of the truck, broken in half, and the bulb was missing. The CB radio antenna on the outside of the car was laying on the hood of the truck, with the antenna wire leading out of the passenger side, as if yanked from the roof of the truck off of its magnetic base. No weapons were found in or around the truck. They found blood splattered on the driver's door as well and on the seat and window, but the larger amount of blood was on the passenger door, with blood 
running out the door onto the ground. There was also a large amount of blood noted on the passenger window. Both truck doors were locked, and blood was noted on the outside of the passenger door, around the doorpost of the rear window, and around the lock and handle, with signs of a scuff or dragging pattern. There was also a small amount of blood on the outside of the driver's door, just above its handle. Now, this was a 1972 Chevy pickup truck, not a newer model like today, that have key fobs and electric door locks. This was back in the day when we had to push the button inside to lock the door or lock it with a key from outside. The blood found outside both doors near the handles or locks seems to indicate that the perpetrator locked both doors before fleeing the scene. This would be further supported by the fact that they found the keys on the ground, discarded nearby. The tag to the vehicle was called in and at that time linked to Harry E. Wolf. The address that came back to the 1972 pickup truck was 2322 West Lawn Drive in Kettering, Ohio, although investigators would later learn that he had in recent months moved from Ohio to Florida and was living in Pinellas County. To their credit, all of these details were noted, a tentative ID was made, and detectives as well as the state attorney's investigator arrived and photos were taken of the outside of the truck before first responders even attempted to unlock the vehicle. And just another note, the state attorney's investigator that was called was Kurt Siver, another name that you have heard multiple times if you've listened to previous seasons. He did interviews in both the Kingfish Boat Ramp case as well as the Merritt Wheeler case out of Arcadia that I covered in season 15. I would love to talk to him about his job experience. I bet he's got some stories. At any rate, they finally got the truck unlocked and began processing the scene, collecting evidence and interviewing witnesses. The case file that I received associated with this case was 174 pages, and a good third of that was duplicate documents. This is not a large case file, and that is likely because investigators had very little to work with. I also have indications that there are some parts of this file that are missing. Police determined that Harry Wolf had been shot in the right side of the head with a 22 caliber handgun, three bullet wounds, in the right side of his cheek and behind his right ear. Based on where the blood was in the vehicle and where on his body he was shot, it seems to indicate Mr. Wolf was likely shot while sitting in the driver's seat by someone in the passenger seat. The splatter on the driver's door would match a shot from that angle, with the majority of blood on the right side indicating his body had fallen over to that side and laid there for some length of time while bleeding, given that there was blood that dripped from inside the vehicle to the ground outside. Law enforcement would later note that it was believed by them that he'd been shot by someone in the passenger seat. My take on where the CB and Mike were located, along with that blood evidence, unfortunately suggests that Mr. Wolf may not have died instantly. He could have even tried to radio for help. That cord was draped across his body, which was on the floorboard, and the mic was dropped near his butt behind him, while his arm was splayed across the seat and his fingers were near the CB radio. And what a horrible thought. This poor man lay dying, locked inside his own car, trying to call for help. It makes me wonder if he managed to get any call out over the CB radio that night, anything at all, any sound, and if anyone heard anything that night or the early morning over the airwaves. There's nothing in that report that tells me they even looked into that, although I'm not sure how they would have done that, other than contacting truckers who might have been listening at the time they think he could have been shot. And I just will give a quick foreshadowing that in my next case out of Manatee County, Truckers were actually contacted about radio communications involved in a murder. As far as the dome light cover being broken, that could indicate a struggle, or it could indicate a passenger trying to quickly get that dome light to turn off, so any onlookers nearby couldn't see what was going on inside the vehicle, particularly if it was dark. The CB antenna having been dragged off of its magnetic perch 
could simply indicate someone having yanked at it while hastily exiting the vehicle, particularly since the wiring from it ran into the truck. Or those same wires could have been grabbed by Mr. Wolf himself while trying to call for help or struggling within the cab of the truck. In addition to the positioning of the body and the CB radio, suggesting that the victim had perhaps tried to call for help in the moments after the shooting, where the vehicle itself was parked is also of value to note. The truck was parked in the last space nearest to an exit onto US 301, across from the Suncoast Motel. This area wasn't necessarily close to the entrance of the store itself, like we often do when we're out grocery shopping. We find a spot near the store. This spot was just inside an exit. And according to the diagram, it was angled such that it appears the car approached from a different entrance or part of the parking lot and parked in a spot nearest to an exit where they would simply back out, pull up a few dozen feet, and then turn left or right out of the lot. Also, this area of the parking lot was directly across from a wooded area. Now, one of Mr. Wolf's pockets was pulled out, indicating that perhaps money could have been taken, but there was also $240 found under the seat in the cab. If the motive here was a simple robbery, they might not have even thought to look beneath the seat, so I don't know that that money being left there can rule out robbery as the motive. The timeline in this case was established by a couple witness accounts. There were also a few witnesses that notified law enforcement with information that could have been related. First off, the same witness who found the vehicle, the Albertsons employee, had an encounter on Sunday the 17th, before Mr. Wolf was even in town, that he felt police should know about. He had gone up to that Albertson store as a customer at about 7 in the morning on Sunday to purchase some meat for his breakfast. He parked his truck on the east side of the lot in front, about four or five spaces down one of the aisles. As he was walking toward the entrance, he was confronted by a white female, about 35 years old, who had come from the direction of the last line of parking spaces on the south side of the lot, near the wooded area. She was pushing a shopping cart containing empty soda bottles. When she got near him, she asked him what he was doing up so early. He told her he was up that early every day. Then the woman asked him if he was in a hurry to get home, and he told her that he had meat he was taking home for breakfast, but he wasn't in a big hurry. The woman then asked him if he wanted to go to a party. He responded, what kind of party? Her reply was, what kind do you want? Now, Mr. Dawson had previously worked for the police department in the vice squad for a time, so he asked her, well, where would we go? And the female pointed toward a motel on the south side of the parking lot and said, 25 bucks. At this point, he said a blue van pulled into the lot and two white males in their 20s got out. Because Mr. Dawson got the impression that the three were working together, he yelled loudly enough for anyone within earshot to hear, $25, you must be out of your mind. The woman then walked past the van and toward the wooded area, pushed her cart over the cement bumper curb and into the woods. She left the cart there and then proceeded to walk toward the road. The two men entered the store and Mr. Dawson left. According to the report, this indicated to police that there was sex work going on in the area of the Albertsons' parking lot. Next in the timeline on Monday between 8.30 and 9 a.m., a woman who worked on Longboat Key approached 75th Street West and Cortez at the intersection going westbound. There, she saw a truck matching Mr. Wolf's, which she described as mustard color with Ohio tags. It pulled out in front of her southbound on 75th and turned toward the beaches. This could be in line with the story that family had told law enforcement that Mr. Wolf had a cousin that lived on the beach who he was headed into town to visit and play golf with. It's at 6 p.m. on this day, Monday, that Mr. Wolf allegedly leaves his cousin's house after calling his wife to say that he was on his way home. A liquor store clerk on duty at Albertson's Monday night, who closed at 10 p.m., says he did not notice his truck 
in the lot at that time, although it's unclear whether this witness would have just generally noticed this or not. A liquor store clerk on duty at Albertson's Monday night, who closed at 10 p.m., says he did not notice his truck in the lot at that time, although it's unclear whether this witness would have just generally noticed this or not. The next day, on Tuesday, the 19th, a witness who visited Albertson's around 8 p.m. saw Mr. Wolf's truck parked where it was later found. A few hours later, in the early morning hours, which now brings us into Wednesday the 19th, this same man, who regularly jogged in the vicinity of the Albertsons, thinks that he heard three gunshots around 1 a.m. while he was out on his nightly run. There are no witnesses related to the truck on Wednesday. And then it's on Thursday that Mr. Dawson, the store employee, notices the truck that has now been in the lot a couple of days, and he approaches it and notices the blood on the ground near the passenger door. The next lead comes from the store manager of a local 7-Eleven store at Cortez and 26th Street, and he tells police that on Friday around 5.50 a.m., two white males came into the store. One went to the newspaper rack, grabbed a newspaper, paid for it, and he said that they went right to the part about the wolf murder. The other white male paced while he read. He said they read this article and left after purchasing only the paper. The manager said that one of the men looked to him like an employee of Cedar Hammock Refuse Disposal, also known as the local waste management. It was unclear to me how the 7-Eleven manager knew for sure they were looking at that particular article or whether they might have been looking at something else. There was one other detail in the report that I found compelling. During the first couple days of the investigation, one of the officers received a call from a Florida Highway Patrol trooper about an encounter that he had had with Mr. Wolf. There was a very short report related to this incident in the file that I received, and this incident occurred in December of 1976, so about four months prior to the homicide. Florida Highway Patrol had received a call in that incident from Mrs. Wolf, who was in Seminole County, Florida. At that time, she again had requested they look for her husband, Mr. Harry Wolf, who was supposed to be en route to Bradenton from Seminole and had not yet arrived at his destination. A FHP patrol trooper in the area found Mr. Wolf's truck parked at the rest area on the Manatee side of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, which is the same bridge that we discussed people fishing off of in the Kingfish case which leads right onto the island and the kingfish boat ramp is on the right just as you exit that bridge. This report noted, though, that he wasn't in his vehicle. Instead, he was in another vehicle parked next to his in the company of a female. The report says that the trooper did a warrant check on both tag numbers, but the result of that was not available to him when the report was written. And the report that I'm mentioning is a supplemental that was written two days after Mr. Wolf's homicide, relaying the events that I'm discussing. Apparently, the investigator on Mr. Wolf's case was waiting for a particular radio dispatcher to come back to work on the 25th so he could pull out his radio logs for the year 1976, which were already in storage. This page of the report ends with, Investigation Continues. There is nothing in the report that tells me that this lead was followed up on. It might have been a good idea to have a chat with that female, whose vehicle Mr. Wolf was in just four months earlier, and whose tag number had been run, so they should have had it on file. And this lead apparently is never followed through to any conclusion. But the more troubling thing to me is that there isn't even an indication that anyone asked Mrs. Wolf about this incident or whether she would have known any female that her husband might have been visiting in the area. That lead just never went anywhere. In April of 2002, Lieutenant Keo met with Mr. Wolf's daughter and granddaughter to see what he could learn from them and discuss the status of the investigation. After that meeting, he arranged to have a copy of the investigative file sent to him for review. Here is some information from his notes. 
Mr. Wolf's daughter said that on the day of the murder, her father had gone to a cousin's house on the beach in Manatee County. He spent the day golfing, and then that evening around 6, he had left his cousin's house to head home. According to her, at that time, Mr. Wolf was acting normally. He just never arrived home. In his notes, the lieutenant that is re-reviewing this case went over all of the details that I have already outlined. He mentioned a report from April 23, 1977, the day after Mr. Wolf was found about a robbery in St. Pete involving a black male that one of the detectives thought could have been involved in the Wolf murder investigation. There doesn't seem to have been anything that came from that lead. He noted that the victim's wallet was found on the floorboard of the truck beneath the victim's body and one of his pockets had been pulled out as if something had been removed from it. He said that the victim's keys were found in the parking lot in close proximity to the truck. He also noted that none of the Albertsons' employees had recognized a picture of Mr. Wolf. He noted that while the original investigator, Detective Haas, had spoken with the victim's wife and daughter, no details were provided as to their conversation. Another investigator wrote a report in May of 1977 about a 22 caliber Beretta that was confiscated and test fired, then subsequently returned to an individual. According to this lead, another individual had been considered a person of interest at that point. But again, nothing ever evolved from that lead. They were basically just checking crimes in the area where a 22 was used and or burglaries had occurred. There was also a transcript of an interview related to that 22 caliber Beretta, and basically the gist is that a witness overheard a conversation about a robbery where a couple hundred dollars were stolen. The individual was heard to say the robbery occurred at Albertson's and someone had been shot, but that victim was in a van at the time of the robbery. When the lieutenant spoke to the original evidence technician, he learned that the victim's truck had been processed twice, once by Manatee County and another time by the Pinellas County Sheriff's Office at their request. A very good fingerprint was found on the wing window of the truck, but it eventually turned out that it was one of the detective's fingerprints, which gives us an indication of whether or not they might have been wearing gloves, the emphasis here being probably not. The evidence technician had formed the opinion that even though the victim was found on the passenger side, he must have been sitting on the driver's side when he was shot. When the lieutenant reviewing this case reached out to the medical examiner's office, he learned that they did not have any autopsy reports from the year 1977. In a later email exchange in the report dated 2007, it was also noted that the medical examiner did not have any reports for the calendar year 1977. And although they did have a logbook of the 1977 autopsies performed for Manatee County that year, Harry Wolf's name wasn't on it. And another tidbit he learned, only from a newspaper article, was that one investigator had traveled to Ohio to conduct an investigative follow-up, but no reports regarding that part of the investigation was in the file either. At the end of this review, the lieutenant noted the following findings. On November 7, 2002, my review of this homicide was completed. Based on my inspection of the file, I make the following observations and recommendations. The investigative file is not complete. The original case file contains the offense report, a few investigative reports, and various evidence reports. There are no autopsy reports contained in the file, nor does the ME's office have any reports regarding the post-mortem exam of the victim. Although the evidence is intact, there are no crime scene reports, photographs, fingerprint cards, or other documents relating to the examination of evidence in this case. He then mentions a number of law enforcement officers that he spoke to regarding the case. Quote, None of which have a great deal of recollection of the events due to the passage of time. The daughter of Harry Wolf will be updated as to my investigative findings. My complete reports will be forwarded to the ICE unit for further review and consideration. The documents reviewed will be returned to the records section of this agency. All of the lieutenant's handwritten notes were in the file that I received. So were a series of newspaper articles that were copied by Mr. Wolf's family members and passed along to him. 
I think the most touching additions were his back-and-forth correspondence with Mr. Wolfe's daughter as to his progress as he evaluated those reports. Clearly, he couldn't do much. There was so much missing from the report. And you know, it's got to feel really shitty to have a case file like this past your desk and not be able to will those documents back into existence so you don't have to tell a family member there's nothing more to be done. That's just never the appropriate answer. But that's essentially what happened here. You can even sense his frustration in that list of questions. Who is Harry Wolf's cousin in Northwest Bradenton? Wolf reportedly left Pinellas for Manatee County at 9 p.m. Why so late? Neither of those questions were answered in the case file that I received. Did that mean that he left at 9 p.m. Sunday night? Where did he stay, if that's the case? And why did he leave so late? In the next episode, you're going to hear from Harry Wolf's granddaughter and from her mother, although that will be through a series of recreated emails that I mentioned between her and the lieutenant who reviewed her father's case. Stay tuned. 